Okay, can I go ahead and get started? All right. Yeah, I was taken with Bill's story about walking around looking for his Pulitzer Prize, and I think we need some kind of hall of pictures for uh, systems engineering. So um, we'll leave that to Tom and, and to Nesh to establish something like that. Um, and appropriate awards. Uh, we, we, we have a lot of catching up to do, apparently, uh, relative to the Pulitzer Prize. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Peter Beeling, and this is joint work uh, with colleagues from Virginia Tech, uh, Tim, Tim Sherburn, Stephen Adams, Ian Russell, and uh, colleagues from Stevens Institute, Tom McDermott and Megan Clifford. And we're, we're building off a lot of work here uh, that goes back a number of years. You can kind of see our list of uh, CERC uh, projects. Um, two of those are, are highlighted because they're actually going to uh, be the subject of uh, talks tomorrow if you're able to, to come uh, to those talks. And I'll, I'll uh, make one more plug before we're done for another event, still another event. Um, we also are building off of a lot of uh, intellectual contribution from uh, Barry Horowitz, and we're very grateful for all of our sponsors. We started with something, you know, this is Eric Day. We started with something that was really not an acquisition problem, but a technical problem, but I will get to acquisition uh, readily enough. So uh, years ago, what we, we were approached and, and asked uh, by the uh, f folks in the department, hey, you know, we've got these UAVs and we're worried that they could be subject to cyber attack. Can you do anything to keep that from happening? Um, and our answer was, well, not us. I mean, we view that as a, a kind of difficult problem to imagine all the ways in which you could get into to something that has physical points of entry, off-the-shelf kind of electronics from all over the world, um, insider threats, and so on. But we would like to look at this question of what to do with the UAV from the perspective of resilience. And that's what I want to focus on today, resilience. Uh, and the notion of, is there a way that we could ensure an acceptable mission outcome uh, you know, given that the attacker has uh, had success at a level. So we're assuming that the, the attack has gone into the system and it's affected uh, the function of, of the system in some kind of way. And the question is, you know, what can we do about it in spite of that, right? Uh, that's the notion of kind of fighting through. And it's a notion that's a lot closer to point defense than perimeter defense in the sense that uh, we, we, uh, we, we want to get close to, to protecting the, the things that really matter. So in the case of the UAV, our solution uh, was kind of simple um, because we, we asked the, the folks that owned this uh, vehicle, you know, what, what do you really care about? What's the nightmare scenario? Can you narrow it down to one or two scenarios that you just really couldn't live with if, if they were to occur? Uh, and the answer that they came back with was, well, what we can't, st you couldn't bear the thought of is an adversary gaining control of the navigation function and taking the aircraft off uh, where they will. Uh, everything else is okay. It's okay if it crashes, it's okay if it doesn't get data and so on, uh, but we can't have that happening. Uh, so in this case, um, what that came down to then was protecting the navigation function. The navigation function is based off of GPS. Uh, and we were lucky because in this, this case, there are two GPS units on the aircraft, one for navigation, but, all, but a different uh, kind of unit uh, for uh, registering the imagery associated with the reconnaissance uh, surveillance pack. And so we were able to put a lightweight uh, computing device that would just compare the outputs from those two GPS units and in the event of a uh, sufficiently large difference, uh, then do something like switch to inertial navigation. There are a number of different things we could have chosen. We could have just said, okay, we're gonna crash or we'll try and force it to come back to a particular point or things like that. Uh, so this is kind of an appeal, appealing idea and, and solution for this little problem and maybe something that could be generalized is, is what we thought um, because it, and for one thing, kind of reverses the asymmetry of the situation. Now we can pick and choose what we're going to uh, choose to, uh, to defend uh, and the adversary has to guess where those are or deal with the consequences. The adversary also has to do things like learn about how the UAVs work rather than just learning about how to break into computer networks, for instance. Um, and um, yeah, we, in general, we could think about maximizing the uncertainty of things for the adversary. So this concept that I, I just spoke to, or this, this little solution that I just spoke to, is, is something that we, we sometimes call a sentinel-based resilience concept. And, and the idea is, is captured in a, in a pattern here that there's 
a sentinel that's watching using its own sensors or internal data from the system, uh, various functions of, of the system, um, uh, such as you know, the GPS outputs. Uh, and then um, based off of what it sees, uh, it then has the ability to, to recommend um, or uh, to engage. There's a spectrum there. You can think of how much to involve uh, the human in the decision, and, and that's a, a very important consideration, as we heard this morning. Uh, so the, the notion is that the Sentinel then, having detected a, a potential attack, would, in, would engage a, a resilience mode of, of operation, or mode of operation that would allow the system for, to preserve key functions. And the nice thing about this kind of idea is that you can make something like the Sentinel um, using um, uh, minimal lines of code uh, and uh, using hardware that is um, not general purpose GPUs. So, the Sentinel can be made much harder than the system that it's, it's helping to protect. So we've employed this kind of concept in a variety of different situations in the military and in civilian situations, and we've dealt with the, uh, the question, or begun to investigate the question, I should say, of um, how much to involve humans in the decisions regarding switching modes of operation or informing them about what's going on with their system. Uh, so there's a lot of, of um, experience that we've gained in this. Uh, and we're not the only ones. There are other people that have, of course, been out there thinking about resilience in uh, deep ways. Uh, MITRE, for example, has um, encoded a lot of uh, their thoughts in, in the form of um, NIST uh, 800-160, Volume 2, uh, where they, they, they describe a number of different techniques for, um, that, are, that are similar. Some of them are similar to what I just described, and others are, uh, have different notions behind them. There's a, a kind of character, though, to all of that work, um, the, all the notions that MITRE has, all the uh, different ways in which we've uh, done similar kinds of things. Um, and that, I, I wanna get to that uh, in just a moment, but I'll just, uh, just pause for a moment and, and, and give a, a definition of resilience. So I wanna distinguish between assurance, which is the ability to, to say uh, with, with, with confidence that my system doesn't have exploitable vulnerabilities, versus resilience. And resilience is the capacity of the system to, given that it's been attacked, uh, recover and maintain essential function. Um, and so the, the notion that I, I wanna drive home here is, is really that when we're, we're talking about something like resilience, we can be agnostic to how things happen. Uh, so we don't really care how the attacker did what they did. We're gonna assume that the attacks are successful to the limit of where we engage our, our resilience. Um, and we're gonna um, think about resilience as a, as a property of the, dynamic property of the behavior of the system. And that's the kind of key point here that I, I, wanna, I wanna argue that to be effective in resilience engineering, and I'll, again, we're gonna get to acquisition too, uh, we must be able to reason about system functions, operational tasks, and missions. And you can kind of see that uh, when you look at something like this uh, diagram, so this is a bubble chart created by, um, by MITRE uh, that's a, a nice way of looking at things that if you're, if you're interested in preventing an attack, then you'd be down at that bottom level looking at those thread entry points and trying to do something down there. Uh, but you know, ultimately what we care about is compromised mission objectives, right? So that opens up the possibility that why don't we think about um, monitoring our system uh, at, at some intermediate level, like the system functionality level, and that's really what we're talking about. Uh, so, um, you know, I said I'd get to acquisition, and let me get there by, by saying that, but if we wanna do this, um, it's not, we won't have the UAV like we had sitting in a warehouse. Uh, we've gotta do this for systems that don't yet exist, right? Uh, and we have to do it in a way that gets us to the point where we can set requirements uh, and, and go through the other uh, parts of, of um, uh, the acquisition life cycle. So that's the real trick is how do we, how do we think about um, the problem of uh, engineering in resilience, setting appropriate requirements, setting architectures, setting the stage uh, for a resilient response um, given that the system doesn't work. And you know, this is a demo talk, right? So we have to get to a demo by the end. And, and the demo is, is really gonna focus on uh, the, um, is really gonna focus on uh, the use of tools, various kinds of tools uh, to uh, 
to facilitate the question of, you know, the questions that I've posed here on this slide. You know, what, what, what to protect and why, right? There's a lot of functions in the system. Which ones are we going to actually protect? Uh, there's all kinds of design patterns design, uh, developed by the CERC, by MITRE, uh, and others. Um, which ones are going to be employed? And how, is all this, how are all these choices going to be made? So um, our, uh, over the course of the years, we've struggled with these kinds of questions a bit and uh, developed an approach that involves uh, bringing together a sets of stakeholders uh, and arming the stakeholders with some tools. And the tools will be the subject of uh, the, the demos later in, w in what I talk about in a few minutes. Um, but we've got the blue team, the gold team, and the red team. The blue team are the system and mission owners. And we're going to give them something in the form of a, a structured elicitation process. Uh, and what we're going to ask them to do is identify their nightmare scenarios uh, and give us a way of scoping uh, what then has to be taken on by the systems engineers to model the system to think through potential resilience architectures uh, and ultimately to get us to, you know, to where, headed in the direction of requirements. Um, and, um, and, you know, so what comes out from the systems engineers then, um, you know, going back to the tools and models are artifacts that are MBSE in nature, right? So we'll have uh, various kinds of representations of the system that can be useful uh, for all the things that we, we want to do later, requirements, tests, and so on. And I hope to give a little flavor of that. Um, and then um, uh, the red team. So these are the in-house adversaries. And, you know, they, unfortunately, it, in, in, in our kind of process, right, they, they're not able to do what they love to do, which is take code and play with it, because we might not have the code, right? We may be doing this pretty far to the left in terms of the acquisition lifecycle. And so the question is, you know, how, do, how can we get the red team uh, to potentially reason about vulnerabilities, um, uh, you know, without having a system that they can actually turn on or fire up or code to, to even look at? And the answer is, well, we're, you know, what we can provide them is a structured view of this system um, we don't have to make them speak uh, uh, MBSE. We can, we can take the MBSE ar artifacts and turn them into GraphML and other things and then run analytics that help the, the red team cross-reference with things like uh, MITRE's attack database and other kinds of uh, characterizations of uh, vulnerabilities and, and attack experience. So um, all of this, um, thinking of the, of the, the various teams and how they interact, uh, is codified in a, a fairly simple iterative methodology, cybersecurity requirements methodology. Uh, and, and the steps are pr pretty much what I just described of, you know, of running through from the, the characterization of, um, of, of operational risk through designs, through vulnerability assessment and iterating. Uh, and the trick is, you know, how do you do that? Um, how do you... Um, uh, you know, think through that kind of process and what kind of tools are available to help. Um, so we want to offer something that's called uh, mission-aware uh, cyber resilience and, and our MA. Um, and what mission-aware brings together is, is really three elements. MBSE, that's its foundation. STPA SEC, uh, and I'll describe what that is in just a moment, but it's a structured process from, uh, that originated in the safety community. Uh, and resilience concepts like our se sentinel based uh oh and now I've done it. Can you all see that? Yeah, okay. Um, like our sentinel based um, resilience architecture. I don't know what I did. Um, so all of those things come together to form mission aware. So the the, the in terms of MBSE, this is what um, our top level uh um, uh architecture really was de derived from a model that looks like this. Um, so this, uh, this, this kind of model, uh, just I want to just put it out as a, a point of reference that it's, you know, that what we're considering ultimately uh, is, the, uh, is the, not only the structure of a system, but the behavior of the system, right? And uh, things like, uh, you know, w w the requirements and the relationship between the requirements and the structure and behavior uh, and uh, verification, notions of test and things like that. This model, and drilling one level uh, deeper, uh, these, this, this, uh, what, what, what the idea here is that if you have a, a, this meta model here, that you are then in a position that you could take this and in principle model virtually any kind of system. That's the intent of this kind of structure, that it's meant to account for 
the kinds of things that one needs to think about in modeling systems and indeed in, in modeling aspects of the systems engineering process. So where did we get this? Did we make this? No, this actually comes from Vitek Corporation. It's their Genesis meta model. Um, we're using it at, um, because it, it has a number of nice features that we expect to see in uh, SysML v2 when it comes along later. So this has semantics built into it. So there's a common understanding of what uh, uh, everything uh, means in terms of uh, words and links have uh, r real definition. There's an ability to hierarchically model things. Uh, there's an ability to capture dynamic uh, elements of systems. So it's a great base for us. And again, we're using it as a, a kind of surrogate for where um, the open source world might be in a, in a few years. Um, so we're combining that kind of uh, uh, technology and, and tool base with uh, STPA. So STPA is, an, uh, is a, a hazard analysis technique that comes out of the safety community, aviation safety in particular, developed by Nancy Levison and others. And the notion is that if you have something like an accident of a, in an aircraft, that you, it's not fruitful or as fruitful to, to view that as um, the confluence of a number of random variables unfortunately coming together as it is to, to view it really in, in hierarchical control terms to view it in terms of, well, actually, you know, before we, that we had that terrible outcome, that loss, uh, we were in a hazardous state, and uh, somebody took an unsafe control action, and nature contributed, and, and uh, so you can begin to moder model in control terms uh, these notions of, of losses and, and loss scenarios and understand them in ways that would allow for you to potentially do things like put a sentinel in place, right, and watch function and say, okay, I'm gonna detect when I get in a hazardous state and I'll do something about it. Uh, so that's the notion. We actually use um, a refinement of STPA called STPA SEC developed by Colonel Bill Young that folds in other things like an adversarial view, appropriate to safety and mission engineering. Uh, so, um, uh, so what have we done? We've, we've taken those three things and, and, and put them to the third thing being that our, our notion of um, a sentinel uh, based uh, uh, resilient co resilience concept and folded them all together into the MBSE structure. And you can see uh, in, in this kind of top level view that we've taken that simple top level view and complicated it a bit by adding in notions of, uh, of loss scenarios and resilience modes and, and sentinel systems. And um, I should say that this is, I don't know, Phil, Phil what was this saying you had? Art, art? This is not art, it's architecture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is software. It's software, um, uh, and it and it has real semantics to it. So it's not just PowerPoint engineering. Um, and um, and when you look down deeper, then you can start to see a lot of the concepts that I mentioned uh, reflected here. And of course, the the demo part, we're going to actually show some case studies. So you can you can you know get your sink your teeth into it, uh, and there'll be other opportunities in in, in the form of. Uh, things to interact with in the hallway where you can look at the at, at models derived from all this in more detail. But let me just mention that, so this is our detailed um, uh, meta model that captures all of the the notions of, of loss-driven systems engineering that I, uh, that are kind of implied by STPA, the idea that we want to think about what we don't want to have happen and, and uh, attempt to prevent that. Um, that has the no notions of uh, the sentinel uh, as being the key to kind of observing the functions of the system in a way that it would allow us to prevent the loss scenarios, uh, observe when we're on the wrong track and prevent them. Uh, and, and so the, um, I think the colors are a little bit different here than, than what I imagine uh, on, on my machine, but uh, the kind of light pink are all the things that we've uh, we've uh, added, does they turn up? No, they're just sort of grayish on the screen. Uh, but uh, we'll have to show that in, in, a, in another way, I guess, later. But uh, we've added a, a lot to the kind of base model that captures all of those elements. And then the, uh, uh, the, the issue is then, how do we get to uh, requirements, uh, right? And you can see requirements sitting as uh, in the color here. Yeah, that's kind of pinkish, reddish purplish um, box towards the, the, the lower middle. Um, and I want to give a little bit of um, uh, 
of understanding of how we might do that. And the key that we've adopted for trying to drive towards requirements that correspond to all of these notions um, is to think about um, operational resilience in a way that's very operational, if you will. Uh, so uh, we're, you know, operational resilience is how the system ends up unfolding, and there's a lot of elements uh, to how a system that's under adversity and is responding uh, using its resilience mechanisms, uh, how all of the elements of that uh, would, could, should play out. Um, and that's really the way that we've been thinking about requirements generation. So we've formulated something called FOREST, the Framework for Operational Resilience in Engineering and System Test. Um, and the FOREST is, is shown here as a wheel. Uh, it's also shown as something that you know, we would like to see applied you know, throughout the, uh, the, the system V. But I want to give a, a bit of a sense of, of FOREST. The, the idea is to take something like uh, the, um, the Sentinel-based resilience concept that I mentioned and unfold it uh, so that we see more and more aspects of resilience playing out in a system as it's under attack. So there's, uh, there's uh, a sensing, um, attack sensing. If we have forest, we have trees, right? Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, so the t trees are the testable requirements, elicitation elements. But you know, really what they are are things that you should think about with regard, you need to think about in one fashion or another with regard to really um, ha uh, playing out resilience. But yeah, you need to sense an attack, you need to isolate it, you need to have potential resilience responses like inertial nav. Uh, but you, know, you can also think about other elements, like what are you gonna provide the owners of the system in terms of a projection as to how much operational performance they just lost uh, or what they might be facing uh, as, as things roll forward. Um, is there any way that you can provide users and operators with confidence about what the system is gonna do. Can you give pilots uh, you know, a, a test they can do with a joystick or, or something like that? So they start to say, okay, yeah, this, this system, which is operating in a mode which I hope to never have seen, but now I'm faced with, you know, I can understand something about it. Um, you know, can, can you, uh, uh, you know, does the system have any technology in it for uh, connecting with the operators with regard to evaluations? Uh, and so on, all the way through the end and the life cycle. And we're go we will cover Forrest in more detail uh, tomorrow at, at one of the, uh, the presentations, but I think that gives a flavor of it. And what we've done is, is um, uh, then taken those, those different tree elements, uh, the way of, of breaking down the rolling out of operational resilience, and cross-reference them with quality attributes, um, you know, like DLDs and other things, so that we can begin to see uh, for each of the, uh, each of the trees uh, what are the potentially most uh, important uh, quality attributes and vice versa, you know, to, or to what extent are the trees really covering uh, notions uh, that are, have been judged to be important in quality. That uh, kind of thinking uh, can be combined with other things like we've been working with uh, the um, cyber survivability attributes promulgated by the uh, joint, joint staff, here they are on uh, CSAs uh, one through 10. And there, it turns out there's been a lot of work on one through six prevention, uh, but not so much on seven, eight, nine, and 10. And, and that's where we wanna contribute. Um, people have thought kind of, of you know, what, it, what it means to take something like recover systems capabilities or, or baseline and monitor systems and detect anomalies, CSA uh, seven, and kind of break it down to one level deeper. Uh, so you need to monitor operational parameters, you need to analyze performance, and, and so on. And so what we've done is use the trees, um, and you can see tracing back between, uh, between what I've got on this slide and the, and the trees on, on the right-hand side, um, and also uh, the quality attributes uh, in, in, in ways where, where we can specify for all systems, these are probably kinds of requirements that you want to have in place. Now they don't specify exactly what things should be, right? Because that, that's gonna be end, end up being specific to the system, but it gives a guiding framework for the specification of requirements. So we've gone through all of those, and then in the case of test, uh, which I wanna just to spend a minute or two on test, um, that, um, you know, that you can also derive associated measures and metrics that uh, um, take us at least a step closer 
uh, to the goal of, of being able to do things like developmental tests uh, for cyber resilience. So if we have a sensible requirements, uh, maybe those are, are testable that we can drive associated measures and metrics. Um, so um, yeah, and I guess one point I wanna make with regard to test is um, that, uh, uh, yeah, um, let's see, how, how am I doing on time? Let's see, I'm 22, okay, I guess I got a couple minutes. Um, yeah, so with test, uh, for, for something like cyber resilience, um, we've developed a, a, a little reference architecture here, and again, you can, you can hear more about it tomorrow, but I'll just say this about res testing for resilience. It's unlike other kinds of tests in a lot of ways, and one of the ways is that, um, you know, with a, with, with a typical uh, kind of test, you might take a, something and drop it, heat it up, shoot it, um, put it, various kinds of inputs into it. With resilience, the action is all about how does the system respond to suddenly finding itself in a, in a strange internal state that it wasn't really designed to operate in, uh, and what happens then. So to do tests uh, of that kind of response, you need an ability, uh, a test support system, uh, and hopefully requirements that were built in to support this from the very beginning uh, that would allow you to configure the internal states of the system. So, um, so that's a, a, a notion that um, is, is, ends up being very important. Uh, I'll also say that we've, uh, we've extended the mission aware meta model to include notions of, of verification and test. Uh, so um, yeah, so let me, let me kind of stop uh, with, the, with the preview here and, and take us pretty, we're not ready for the video yet, but we'll get there in a second. Let me just um, make a, a kind of plug for additional resources that you uh, can, can find if you're interested in this topic. Of course, I'd be very happy to talk with anyone and to, to brief your organizations. But the um, first thing I'll mention is that we're currently engaged with uh, the DAU in, uh, in developing some courseware based off of these concepts and tools uh, that would support their efforts to develop uh, credentials um, in, uh, in cyber resilience. And so hopefully you'll be seeing the outputs of that over you know, kind of the near to medium term. And that's ongoing and that's part of a larger effort uh, that uh, where, where CERC is supporting DAU in digital engineering that Nicole Hutchison is gonna talk about uh, tomorrow. So plug for both, both of these things. Um, also, there's a tutorial uh, that that uh, 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 I'll be leading, but other people will be participating in, uh, Tom, um, on, on Thursday, um, that uh, goes, and, 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 and Tim Sherburn as well, that goes into uh, detail uh, on all of these topics. So I wanna put a plug in for that. And then uh, finally, there's a, a website uh, that we've started and we're gonna continue to develop to allow people to kind of get uh, a refresher of uh, what some of these concepts are and then to begin to interact with the models uh, that we have for a case study. Um, and all of that, the website and the ability to interact with the published view of the models, not the models themselves, but their, their kind of PDF version of the models, if you will, uh, that um, that's in the, in, the, in the hallway. We have a demo uh, and, uh, and the, the models that we have make reference to a case study uh, and that uh, of a notional uh, weapon system. Uh, so not a, not a real weapon system, but one that has a, an admirable balance between um, simplicity and complexity uh, allows us to study these issues. And uh, that case study is the subject of a video that I'd like to play now. So if you all would hit it. This is uh, Mr. Tim Sherburn. The Silverfish the case study is presented using the web view of the Vitec uh, Genesis MBSC modeling tool. The Silverfish system is a uh, hypothetical networked munition system. And there's a set of obstacles that have munitions that can fire upon a physical attacker. And there's a mobile operator that has a control station to control that firing. Additionally, the system supports situational awareness from a set of sensors, including a UAV, infrared sensors, 
and seismic and acoustic sensors within the obstacles. Each folder in the left-hand navigation represents an entity from the Mission Aware MBSC model. Additionally, there's a package navigation where each package uh, represents a step in the CSRM process. Step one is the system description. We'll first focus on the system architecture, starting with the system context. We can view the physical block diagram, and here we see in the center um, the notion of silverfish and the external things it connects to, the human actors, the UAV, and on the left here, the mission-aware subsystems that monitors and potentially reconfigures the system. We also include the test support system and the tester as part of the context. Drilling into the system, we see the physical block diagram for Silverfish itself, including the different control stations uh, for fire control, situational awareness, a radio relay network for wirelessly connecting the obstacles and uh, sensors, and a deployment station for uh, setting up the system into the field. Next, we'll explore the behavior model via looking at use cases. Here's the top level uh, use case packages for the system, and we'll go into the silverfish use cases. Um, two main use cases we'll look at it in terms of a diagram here. Basically monitoring the field with a situational awareness and protecting the field using the fire control against physical attackers. Going into the uh, monitor field use case, um, we see the description of preconditions, postconditions, and then the elaboration of um, how the monitor field works. We can look at the functional flow block diagram and see the flow of information up from the physical attacker entering the field, the UAV detecting them, the sensors within the field feeding in sensor data to Silverfish, all the way up to the operator here uh, making situational awareness decisions based on those sensors, whether to fire or not fire on a physical attacker. Next, we'll turn to the operational risk assessment. And here we see that the definition of losses, hazards, and hazardous actions are, are done. Starting with the losses, we see that there are four identified losses for silverfish. We'll investigate the first one here, the loss of life for a military. Here we can see that that loss is caused by the following three hazards here. We'll look at the weapon misfire hazard and see how that can lead to the three losses we looked at above and is caused by these two hazardous actions. The incorrect firing hazardous action here we can see how it's linked and is a variation of a control action for firing the munition. We'll now turn our attention to potential resilient modes for the Silverfish system. Here we see the set of resilient modes that have been identified. The first one we'll look at is the uh, re diverse redundant radio relay. And here we can see the various components that are impacted uh, by that reverse redundancy. The next CSRM step is the vulnerability assessment. Here we'll take a look first at the remediations for the system. And the remediations can be things from defensive mechanisms, hardening mechanisms for the system, and finally like the diverse redundant solutions that Sentinels will help protect. Uh, We'll look now at the loss scenarios that have been identified. Here's the set of loss scenarios. Diving into the manipulated fire command, we see elicited requirements, including performance requirements for the Sentinel, constraint requirements for the Silverfish system to enable the Sentinel, and finally, test support system requirements. We see here that um, this can lead to the incorrect firing hazardous action. It's protected by the following remediations, 
and is detected by monitoring the MQTT message bus. Finally, we turn our attention to the verification and test step. Here we are going to first investigate testing of the cyber resilience for the system. And here we see that we have a verification requirement to verify each of the loss scenarios identified. And then for each loss scenario, we have a specific test activity and test configuration. The test configuration for this particular loss scenario involves the fire control subsystems, the vehicle sentinel, and the diverse redundant fire control. Switching back now to the um, test activity here. We have a functional flow block diagram for the testing activity. And here we see it's a, a loop that iterates for all the loss scenarios identified in the system. And then for each associated resilient mode, we do the following tests. We start by verifying that we can properly sense it, that we can properly isolate the loss scenario, then for each resilient mode, we verify that we have a resilient mode, that we can properly evaluate it, verify confidence, verify readiness, and finally verify execution. Good, and um, yeah, thank you for that, Tim, for making that movie. I think that you maybe should be the first award winner on the, um, on the, on the uh, new, new uh, hallway with pictures. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, in, in this hallway, uh, we have a demo set up if you'd like to go and cl you know, click through the models in the way that Tim was just demonstrating that's, that's available. So um, with that, you know, I think I'd like to stop and, and take any questions. So in uh, some uh, aerospace systems, they have a real desire to have the machines controlled with uh, plug-and-play bus architectures, particularly Ethernet. One of the problems that you have there is that when you send a command to an effector or a sensor, uh, you don't, it's, it's indeterminate. You don't know exactly when you're going to get the answer back. So sometimes a slow response could look like some sort of failure, but you don't really know how to arbitrate that. Uh, my question is, do you guys see any confluence between what you're doing for resiliency and trying to make these ethernet type buses work on very complex systems that have to have an answer in essentially milliseconds as to whether something's functional or it's busted? Well, I think that's a great question. We haven't thought about that, so that would be uh, an area that I'd love to have a conversation on. I think you'll find a lot of the issue is the time. Okay, thank you. And so you're saying the issue there is the, is the timing of things. It makes it very difficult to, to determine whether you're... Uh, F-16, F-22, F-35, they all have determinant buses. And so changing the software or changing the hardware gets really expensive because you have to test the hell out of it to make sure the software doesn't do something strange. If you had a bus architecture like Ethernet, it wouldn't matter where you put that box on the airplane, it would still work. The problem is you don't have this robustness to figure out if you don't get the answer in the right frame, you know, how to deal with it. Very good. You know, um, I will say that one time we, 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 I won't say where we went, but we went somewhere to, and talked about these kinds of issues with a, with a group that had to do with aircraft. And, and we asked them, what's your number one concern? Cyber attack on, on the aircraft, okay. They're very, very concerned with it. Uh, well, we, we would like to do this kind of thing. We can't let you put a box on, we can't afford the weight. Okay, well, can, can we have you know, some of the communication on the buses. No. Can we have one bit? No. <laughs> so <laughs> there, there is a, um, you know, there's that side of it too. Somebody needs to make room for these kinds of. Yeah, which is why we got to think really early, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, so, um, Welcome all steps in that direction. Any other questions?
Peter, I have a question. In, in this concept of using it as Sentinel to represent the mission and make certain that it sort of stays on track, do you find an area in the mission space where either the oversight Sentinel is too conservative and we're trying to actually issue it in order and say, no, I'm not gonna go do that, that's you know, too close, or it's, it's too liberal on one side and it's too vulnerable to attack. So is there a middle ground where it's hard to say where to set the needle and where to control the space because there is this overlap of this is a military weapon system and, and you know, Sometimes I want it to do something that's, a, that's more risky or sometimes I, it's less risky. Is, is, do you find that at all? Yeah, I, I think I get the, the sense of your question. And, I, and I, I, I'd say that um, you know, a lot of the way that the Sentinel is, is, is designed to work and this whole concept is through the identification of um, what the, the mission owners care about, right? And so I think your questions get to, to the nature of to what extent um, can we actually express those things um, and translate them from the mission uh, to, to something like a box that's just monitoring a bunch of, of data or comparing two signals like the example I gave. And that's, you know, that's kind of a, a, a big translation, right, to go from, well, I don't want this terrible mission outcome to happen and the kill chain to be broken in these ways. I couldn't stand it if that happened. Uh, to, well, like, exactly how is it that we're going to, to be monitoring for those kinds of events. Um, and there are system of systems effects too that are important that uh, sometimes if, we, if we're um, overly aggressive in, um, uh, in using sentinels at the level of system systems, um, when we, we start combining systems uh, together, we may see unintended um, consequences of the act from the actions of the sentinels themselves. So we think we're doing a good thing and we could end up doing a bad thing. So I, I guess I don't have answers for you other than the, the, these are excellent questions and we're, we're trying to think through them, but they engender a lot of the bridging between the, the mission and the, and the system or between an individual system and collections of systems. So we have a few questions from our virtual audience. Dr. Beeling, how do you model the attack scenarios? Do you develop misuse cases associated with the use cases? Yeah, so, so in, in, some, in some ways we're, we're, you know, we're agnostic to what are the attack scenarios. So we'll leave it to the attacker to decide how they ended up affecting system functionality and try and stay as close to the idea of, of watching the system function as we can. Um, now there is one kind of a, attack surface and, and potential scenarios that we really have to pay a lot of attention to, and that's the surface that's induced by anything that we add, um, in, like a sentinel to a system. So that itself has an, has a, an attack surface, and we have to think about ways to, to really view that um, as, as something that needs to be hardened. And I think we have time for one okay. last question for you. How does the model simulate potentially undesirable emergent behaviors for each of the identified attack scenarios in the case study? Um, so emergent, emer, um, yeah, so repeat, repeat that one so I can, <laughs> I, I can try. How does the model simulate potentially undesirable emergent behaviors for each of the identified attack scenarios yeah, in the case study? Okay, and that's a really good question that is, Again, we're, we're gonna think about it in terms of maybe the resilient scenarios, right? So we have the loss scenarios uh, rather than attack scenarios and, 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 th and trying to think about how resilience will play out in the system is a, is a, is a tough thing. What I showed today uh, doesn't give a lot in the way of ability to do dynamic simulations. We're taking steps towards um, that, uh, that kind of idea of wanting to be able to uh, simulate system behavior so we can see how resilience uh, actually might play out and that might be different than how we conceive it, right, if we can develop dynamic simulations. To hear more about that, I want to put in a plug for Tom McDermott's talk uh, tomorrow, uh, WRT uh, 1033, where, you know, we, we don't have the answers, but we're at least posing the questions that are similar. So good question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Reeling. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all.